Um, we'll start off here uh, with some introductions. Uh, participating panelists in today's webinar will be Jean Bornack, Senior Vice President of Invista's Retail Practice, Steve Congro, Director of Omnichannel Fulfillment Technology at Saddle Creek Logistics, and Chris Walton, CEO of Red Archer and OmniTalk. Thank you all for being here with us today. Thanks so much for having us. Thank you very much. Good to be here. All right, so um, as you can see, this is our agenda for today. Um, we'll definitely take a deeper dive into some introductions here so you can get to know some of our panelists that we'll be presenting today. Um, we'll have a short presentation from Jean Bornack. And then we'll dive right into an interactive fireside chat, some audience Q&A, and um, some closing remarks, and some reminders about some of our future presentations. So um, yeah, if we want to start here, uh, Gene, do you want to go ahead and Steve and Chris can follow with some introductions? Sounds good. Thanks, Kaylin. Um, this is Gene Bornack. As Kaylin mentioned, I'm Senior Vice President uh, at Invista in running our retail uh, business unit. I've been in retail for about 33 years, um, starting out in store operations, um, working into um, buying and planning, and for the last um, 20 years, um, helping retailers um, find the right solutions and implement them, um, including um, solutions across uh, e-commerce, um, ERP, store operations, order management, and planning and allocation. And um, currently leading a team at Invista helping um, retailers do the same. Great. And Steve, uh, you're up next. Hey, good morning, everyone. My name is Steve Congro. I'm the director of Omnichannel Technology for Saddle Creek. Uh, Saddle Creek is a 53-year-old third-party logistics company uh, specializing in handling both uh, B2B warehousing, traditional pallet and pallet out type uh, clients, as well as e-commerce fulfillment, you know, each picking, B2C. Uh, shipping small parcel, as well as mixing the two. So retail, you know, our clients and retailers can utilize our services for both things like store replenishment and, and, and shipping to big box stores, as well as direct consumer from the same inventory. And prior to Saddle Creek, I spent about 12 years at Fanatics. Uh, who, if you haven't heard of Fanatics, they're the parent company of NFL Shop and DA Store. They run nearly every sports e-commerce site in America. Um, I led OMS, WMS, and Parcel Team. Thank you for having me. Yeah, wonderful. All right, and last but not least, Chris. Yeah, hi. Hi, I'm Chris Walton. Thanks for having me. I really appreciate the opportunity to be here today. Um, I am the CEO of Red Archer Retail. Um, I have about a 20-year career in retail overall. Started my career at The Gap, actually out in San Francisco, mostly in supply chain, and then Ended up working for Target for a good number of years after business school. So spent about 12 years at Target, did almost every job under the sun, started out my career in, in traditional stores, merchandising, actually went out into the field and ran stores in Colorado for a bit of time. Uh, was then fortunate enough to be the vice president of home furnishings for Target.com and finished out my career at Target, uh, heading up a project called the Store of the Future, which was five to 10 years out. Why are people still coming to physical stores to shop and how would you conceive of the target brand and answering that question. And of course, order management and supply chain questions were very much related to that project. Uh, now I do a couple of things under the Red Archer Retail umbrella. So I have my own blog called OmniTalk where I write about that topic specifically. I write for Forbes on a regular basis, do a number of different podcasts and videos each week. And our topic is always on how will the future of retail play out? Uh, and then the other thing I do is I'm also uh, just about to open up a retail technology lab in Minneapolis called Third House where we'll have a physical place devoted to the further study of that question, where retailers, brands, and technology companies can come together and collaborate and try to understand how the future of retail will unfold. So I'm excited to talk with you today, and uh, thanks for having me. Awesome. Well, yeah, um, as everyone can uh, hear, we've got some great experience um, here today on this webinar. So I think with that, uh, Gene, I will turn it over to you. Thank you, Kaylin. And good morning again. Um, let's spend the next few minutes going through a brief presentation on um, order management, um, which is clearly um, uh, a key topic for many people today in the in the retail and consumer products, and even manufacturing and wholesale industries. Uh, you know, the, this morning we'll spend, or this afternoon we'll spend some time going through um, order management in its um, current state and. Um, the road to profitability around order management. But first, let's, uh, let's take a trip down memory lane and, and disconnect today's order management with um, what we called order management maybe uh, 
a decade or two ago in, in retail. You know, 15 years ago, order management really started to change from what it had been for the previous 10 or 15 years. Order management originally had grown up around the direct channel, specifically catalog and then in support of, of e-commerce, um, but it was mostly about order processing and routing and getting the credit card transactions or, or the payment transactions processed so orders could then get into, into the supply chain. Um, completely different um, than where we are today. Um, but over time, as we went through the start of the e-commerce revolution, uh, retailers were faced with the, with the challenge that they had multiple pools of inventory, multiple transaction flows, and no real way to manage those without separate non-integrated teams. Moving forward into the era we're in now, um, companies are challenged to try and figure out, are they thinking first about the company's goals or have they created a customer-centric environment? And by customer-centric, I mean focused first on what does she want, when does she want it, how does she want it, and where, right? Before you start building out all your processes and aligning your people and all of your capital, do you know what the expectations are? Are you really still thinking about the way we think, thought of things 20 or 30 years ago, which is, I have a top line goal, I have a bottom line goal, how do I push inventory into, into the process and cross my fingers and hope that the customers arrive? Today, customer centricity is kind of king. Um, I, I believe, uh, you know, where we've evolved in, in retail is we've moved to, to four pillars of retail from three. And, I, and, and Chris, I think this is something that, that you're pretty passionate about. Yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, the way I like to look at this in terms of where we've been versus where we are now and especially where we're going is, I mean, I think if you look back to retail, you know, pre the advent of Amazon and other digital players, say pre, you know, mid 90s, really all retailers ever had to concern themselves with were really three pillars of differentiation, really. It was brand, price, and assortment. You know, if you had a niche on any three of those, you could do, you know, you could do fairly well and you could probably go through your Rolodex of retailers and, and think about who plays well in each of those, you know, specific arenas. But once the 90s came along and, you know, then everything was really supercharged by the advent of the mobile phone, you know, in the mid 2000s, speed and convenience really became, you know, that fourth pillar of differentiation. And so, you know, you could do those other previously said three things well, but if you really aren't keeping pace on the speed and convenience expectations of the modern day consumer, people are probably going to gravitate somewhere else. And so now you have to always be thinking about those four things within the context of who you are as a retailer, going back again to the point around customer centricity, you know, to decide what tactics and approaches you're going to take and specifically, you know, how your order management system is going to play into those tactics and choices that you ultimately decide to do. Great points. You know, I think about the journey to um, customer expectations today um, and to take this to a little personal, I, I remember my very first ever Amazon order almost 20 years ago, and I had no expectation. As a matter of fact, I was surprised when I opened my own mailbox one day and found a book inside, right? Back when we thought of Amazon as a bookstore, um, they hadn't moved into the realm of time or any of these other expectations. So just over the last couple of decades, we've gone from the, I order something, and it shows up or I go into a store and maybe they have my product to, I expect to order it and get it as quickly as the next several hours. And I always expect when I walk into a, a retail location that they'll work to try and make sure that I get exactly what I want. It's no longer acceptable as a customer for me to walk in and have somebody say, sorry, we just saw the last one in your size and maybe we'll get something you like next season. Uh, the, the whole area of that expectation game has changed completely and it's different among different customer sets for different retailers. It's a challenge. And if you start out with customer centricity and understand the customer's um, needs, that, that pillar of expectations becomes much more um, uh, readily available as far as um, success goes. So when, when we think about what to look for when selecting the right order management uh, solution for your organization, it really comes down to searching for uh, something that's not one size fits all. Uh, when, when we think about what's right for you, it's where are you on the curve 
to omni-channel and what are you trying to achieve? You know, really the front end of the, the application stack really makes a difference, right? So um, is it usable? Will your teams be able to execute seamlessly and without any real challenges what the customer needs? What are the key features you're looking for? Are you looking for the ability to customize the fulfillment experience for the customer? Are you looking for um, robust business rules? Are you looking for something that's AI enabled? And ultimately, it's very important to think about integrations. We're talking about order management of the future or today where it's no longer a conversation about I've got three different channels or four different channels or whatever your, your business arrangement is. It's about how do I integrate all of my people, all of my, my store fleet, my omnichannel experience, all my inventory together at one time. So integration becomes a very key, a very key characteristic, you know, and it's really the, the key point here is, is that order management distilled down to its finest point is ultimately an integration project. So when we think about that, and I don't want to spend a lot of time uh, on this slide because there's quite a lot going on here, but one of the things when I think about order management is I think that it sits at the center of a bunch of inputs and outputs, right? So unlike the, the old order management thinking or the old single channel thinking where I have a fairly linear process where I load inventory into the process and at the other end, the customer um, meets me at my predestined channel and acquires the inventory. Today, we can we can have a, a whole bunch of things going on, right? We can have a bunch of ways that the customer interacts um, with us, right? That it's anywhere, commerce, anytime, any place the customer wants. And once they've interacted with us real time, we need to respond to that interaction. We need to be able to make sure that they understand what we can do, set the expectations, and then we have to fulfill, right? So fulfillment needs to be connected in a way that we understand when we're interacting with the customer that that's going to be a dropship item, or that item's coming from a, a third-party logistics provider, or it's coming out of a physical store or one of our distribution centers. We need to know that at the time that the customer demand is created, because we need to be able to set the customer expectation to really um, over deliver against that expectation, right? And all of these things happen in real time and are orchestrated by order management in the center of the whole process. So when we think about that, you know, why do we hear stories of retailers who have embarked on an omni-challenge journey and they continue to struggle with profitability. We can't really open the paper any given day without hearing about somebody news chapter 11 filing or their excess um, $2 billion in inventory or any number of, of very um, difficult scenarios for retailers. It, it, it comes down to this. In, in the opinion of the panelists, retail has really um, done a terrible job recently of understanding retail. Right? But that would mean Frankly, customers have things they want. Customers have things they need. They have, they have expectations, right? Retail has always been about, I have a product, you have a demand for the product. We meet at some point in the, in the process and exchange my product for your, for your money. A lot of retailers have gotten tangled up with, you know, how do I cut cost? How do I pay debt? How do I make my problem, somebody else's problems, and have gotten away from retail 101, which is how do I present product when the customer wants it, where they want it, at the price they want it, right? Order management can help um, start solving those problems in a profitable way by exposing all of your inventory all the time and all the potential ways that you can meet the customer's needs. You know, in a lot of cases, business rules for the way Omnichannel is executed in order management have not really been um, totally um, totally ironed out, right? So, you know, some retailers are doing things like shipping items in, you know, multiple boxes when they could ship them complete for a slightly higher cost um, in the effort. Um, 
it's more money sometimes to ship for a store than a warehouse. It really depends on that specific of the orders. And what a lot of retailers have done is they put very ironclad rules and say, we'll do X, we'll do Y, we'll do Z. And a deviation from those things isn't possible, and that's where the profit could lie. Um, and then the, the biggest question comes down to when you think about it with e-commerce being 10 to 15 percent of total sales, um, it's, it's an interesting question why retailers do anything other than brick and mortar because it's the only thing that they seem to be able to have figured out how to make money with. But modern order management, though, none of these things needs to be the case. Um, integrating your order management solution properly into your enterprise and then Thinking through the customer centricity can help you create uh, processes that can really fulfill the customer orders in a profitable fashion and help you grow your customer account. And one of the other challenges is customer expectations, right? So if you're in a world where um, product moves through your supply chain and it takes 30, 40, 50, even 60 weeks between when you think about that product and when it's on the customer's hands or on the shelf, it's very hard to adapt to customer expectations where they're thinking about, I see a product this afternoon, I want the product tomorrow morning. Um, and, and, and frankly, those expectations are gonna to continue to get more difficult. Um, and with those rising customer expectations, there are some things that really just aren't realistic to be done, right? So um, retailers can't and shouldn't attempt to, to um, play Amazon's game. You know, Amazon is ultimately a technology company with a massive physical footprint in distribution. And the things that they can bring in commodities, um, you can't match in, in a lot of cases as a retailer. Where you can beat Amazon is in customer experience around brand, um, creating loyalty, um, setting expectations correctly. Um, you can turn your stores into fulfillment centers, and that will help. Right, so every place where you store inventory, an order management system will allow you to um, identify that inventory and move that inventory to the right customer. Now, the right customer may be for that inventory only in that physical store. It may also be a customer down the street. It may be shipped through um, a customer who's arrived through a third-party portal like an Amazon or an eBay, um, or it, you know. It could be, you know, shipped back to the warehouse for consolidation for another day. But you really need to decode the options based on your, your capital available to you and your model, right? So um, if you're a dollar store versus a Tory Birch versus a Costco, the way you're going to deploy order management, the way you're going to think about fulfilling those customer set expectations and setting those expectations is going to vary vastly. Customer centricity is really key to to this, this whole um, new world of order management, right? Um, tying one tool in your organization that has all the information about all the orders in your business, all the inventory, um, understanding the customers, allows you to focus on learning what your customer really wants. Um, know who you are, know your brand, right? So when you execute using order management, um, you need to think about the execution process as it relates to who you are as a brand, right? So if you're shipping $2,000 handbags, those shouldn't come out of a store in a plain brown cardboard box, right? You need to think about how you're gonna execute. And you need to execute um, repeatedly in, in that way, right? So like I mentioned before, Costco is not Tory Burch, right? Shipping me a refrigerator that I've ordered online instead of making me pick it up in the store is very different than sending me key components to a, a killer outfit from a, a well-known brand and how those come to me, the expectations I set, and the process of taking those back to the store, returning those, should all be in support of the, the notion of what your brand is. And if you're a 50 store fleet versus 500 or 5,000, the way you're going to think about inventory and execution of those orders as they come through from multiple points in your in your omnichannel world is going to be different. So we don't always want to be in a me too phase and say, okay, well, you know, Target has 1,700 stores that they've deployed this massive footprint of omnichannel. I want to be just like Target, but I only have 85 locations. Those things don't work. You can 
take the best ideas of, of the competition and focus the, those on what it means to your brand. Chris or um, Steve, do you have anything to add as we're going through that? No, my friend, I think, Gene, I think you did a good job. I, I, love, that. I love the next slide too. It's a, it's a great transition. So, you know, when we start to think about uh, the future shop and store of the future, right? Um, where does retail go from here? Uh, it's, it's my, my opinion after um, these years that retail, bricks and mortar retail is, is not going away. As a matter of fact, um, the, the vote on that's been pretty solid from the e-commerce only uh, players, the, the people um, like the Warby Parkers of the world who had stunning success online only and moved into, have moved into adding physical stores. Amazon um, is, is a big believer in the synergy between physical and digital, right? So um, where we go next for the future of retail is, is really to remove those integration barriers, right? Uh, your customer, your business needs to understand what's going on um, real time across the business. Uh, inventory needs to be visible and available. And you really need to think about uh, making sure that there aren't technologies in place that slow that process down. And we've moved to a real-time or a near real-time world. The, the time for a batch process where orders drop in from someplace and then process for hours and hours and then um, fulfillment strategies are executed and you know those orders are fulfilled, and it doesn't work. Uh, we, we're no longer in that, in that environment. Uh, and building safety stock around those orders um, because you've got a batch process means that you have now spent extra money on inventory to make sure that you're not disappointing a customer rather than fixing the integration so it can be um, displayed and executed in real time. And really, and the future of retail is about um, dynamic capabilities, right? The ability to manage growth and change, right? To understand where your customer is taking you, where your, where your brand wants to go, and to be able to grow rapidly, right? So we see a large growth of things like pop-up stores and the ability for retail to be short time in a specific location, the ability for you to pivot to new concepts. Order management will support all of these. Um, there are customers out there um, who um, learn about a brand only a few months out of the year. There, there are retailers right now who they go from store fleets of 700 to store fleets of 2,100 um, for three or four months out of the year. To do that, to do that successfully and not to own too much or too little inventory, um, it really requires an order management solution at the center of it to be able to execute efficiently against that, that rapid spike of customer demand. And, and really focus on untying the knots, right? So where are the points of friction for your customers? If you sat down with your customers and asked them what they dislike about you or what challenges they have, if you sat down with associates, um, figure out where those knots are and use the power of order management to untie that, right? Put order management to the center of the operation where it can focus on knowing all the orders and all the inventory and all the customers and allow that to work as a central nervous system for your business. Let everything flow in and out through that and take away a lot of the things that, it, that impede the process. You know, um, I love this this quote, and this is really about doing this right, right? So um, Arthur C. Clarke said, any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. And what that means to me is, is pretty fundamental. The customer shouldn't know you're doing these things. If you've executed an order management and omni-channel strategy uh, properly, the customer shouldn't have any idea that it happens. What they should be thinking about is brand, and value and satisfaction. They shouldn't know or care that it's coming from, you know, a store 3,000 miles away or that um, it's being drop shipped from the vendor. What they should know or care is, is will they be delighted by the product when it arrives? Will they walk into the store and find things on the shelf um, because um, somebody thought through the order management process and didn't take inventory from their store to fulfill some other needs, right? They really thought through the way the process works. Um, make it make it magical. 
Gene, I love that quote too. I, uh, when we were doing the work for Target on their Store of the Future project, that was actually a quote that we, we used quite a lot. And another way we framed it up was, you know, that, that digital really at the end of the day should never feel like a layer in terms of anything you're undertaking. It should always be a material almost interwoven into the fabric of your entire operations. And you really have to look at it across three parts. Really, there's digital is important, but so too is the architectural and physical design of what you choose to do, as well as the human service element, uh, you know, that many retailers incorporate in addition. So really across the digital, physical, and human divides, you have to have this complete fabric interwoven at all times. And that's the way I like to think of it, almost like a, a sheet of fabric where all three of those things are interwoven together. And when you're doing it, it right, that's when retail really works well in this new age. Uh, and order management is really underneath all of that, kind of the glue that makes all of those three things work in concert. It's kind of what binds that fabric together, so to speak, as one of the integral systems. So yeah, I think that quote's amazing. Absolutely. And to add to that, Chris, I would also say that, you know, to the point about, you know, how OMAT, you know, kind of ties everything together. Uh, but you're absolutely right. The human element is it, something that, that is not going to go away. And part of the reason for that is between OMAT, you know, the technology and the human element, you know, you want to have a unified experience for your customers. So whether they're shopping with you on a bread and brick and mortar store or on a mobile device, you know, the, you know, the, the process shouldn't be disjointed. The process should be unified. So you have one brand, you know, brand presentation, you know, one view of inventory, that sort of thing. Definitely. Right. And that, and that takes us right to, you know, the thought that, that this is about weaving together people, process and technology, right? So, you know, while that, that technology should be indistinguishable from magic, it really starts to get to that point by, you know, know the focus of your business, know, know what customers expect, but really know who you want to be, right? Um, and start thinking about how you focus, right? Are you a lifestyle brand? Are you a, a needs-based business? You know, do you provide simple sustenance because people buy food from you? You know, think about the business rules, right? Think about the flexibility in, in those rules and how do they support the way your uh, your business is focused, right? So if you if you define a business that is about maximum service, and you know, and you're running a luxury business, then you don't want to create business rules that make it difficult for the customer to achieve what they want. You want to go the extra mile. But if you're a very value or cost driven business, right? You, you want to create business rules that support that and that meet what the customer expects about you, right? So the way you're going to fulfill um, orders as, and have product available as, as a clearance retailer will be different as a high-end luxury retailer. You know, and, and really build that OMS process that fits your business, right? So, you know, OMS fundamentally is an integration project to start with, right? But then if you think about how you execute, right? So what are the processes that fit your business that you want OMS to do, right? Do you, do you want to provide the customer the opportunity to wait a little longer but save some money, right? Is that who your customer is? Or is your customer focused on getting it as quickly as possible and cost is less of an issue for them? How do you, how do, you do those things within your, your processes? And how do you align the people behind the scenes, right? So how do you align buying and planning processes to support your inventory strategy that is executed by order management? Really think about selecting technology that fits who you are and is agile, right? So when we talked about growth and change earlier, right? So, you know, there are some people who've gone down the path of order management and have selected tools that are rigidly defined and find that 18 months in now they've made an acquisition or they've been acquired and change is a difficult thing for them. So think about what your future holds and the level of flexibility and agility you want to bake in and then ask for help, right? So, um, this is, this is, um, really, um, putting a new brain into your organism, right? You know, this sits behind everything. We shouldn't see order management doing its thing as customers, right? So ask for help in, in selecting that and implementing it because this is going to most likely be a radical change from the way you've approached business in a lot of ways. 
which means that you probably will need some people to help um, understand the impacts of those changes and how to make those changes optimal um, for your business. You know, and, and at the end, right, you can't just wedge in technology and give it to your customer and, um, and say, hey, here you go. Um, and, and you can't do it to your associates either, right? It's, I'm, I'm reminded of a, a retailer recently who started embarking on omni-channel, and um, the way they handled it was instead of integrating this all together, they just put an extra PC and printer in all their stores. Um, so then whenever orders would come in from wherever, the store associates would have to manually go to that device to understand that there was demand for their inventory and execute, but there was no connection to their day-to-day -day world or to their understanding of customers. So they had created a process that was actually worse for associates and probably not any better for, for the associates because integration was something they didn't want to face up front. They just went some technology and with hope that it would you know, improve sales. Great. All right. Well, um, Gene, thank you so much, as well as um, Steve and Chris for sharing uh, these insights, you know, on really where retailers should be focusing today, um, really how to get there and where the future of retail stands. So, um, you know, I think this is a good intro into uh, what's next, which is our fireside chat. So um, here we will uh, kind of dive in a little bit deeper on some specifics, talk to Chris, Steve and Gene. So, um, yeah, Chris, I'd love to start with you here. Um, you know, how do you remember retail 10 to 20 years ago? <laughs> I always love that question. Yeah, I mean, I think it's funny because, you know, retail, retail is kind of a creature of habit. Like, if you look back at the historical trajectory of retail, like every 30 to 40 year to years, retail has been changing. But it's really only been since, I think, as I alluded to before, in the <laughs> late 90s and then with the mobile phone recently that we've seen some, some really big changes. Prior to that, even though there were new innovations in retail, like shopping malls and, you know, I think Piggly Wiggly had the first grocery store that we know today back in, you know, I think it was 1916. But what's interesting about that whole period of time pre-1990 is, that, you know, retail or even now, last 10 years, retail always happened the same way, right? Like, and I always think of things psychologically, but really retail buying and shopping were always one and the same, you know, throughout its history. You'd go into a store, there'd be a ton of products stocked out on shelves and you would basically act as a default warehouse picker and go pick those items off a shelf and, you know, take them home with you. You know, sure there were catalogs and things like that, but it just, it, you know, it, it just didn't have the same import. And so, you know, for the most part, those psychologies were interwoven. And I think now, you know, around the edges of what we were just talking about in the presentation, now we're in a world where we have different demands on speed and convenience. The generations are different. The younger generations expect things at a press of a button. And they no longer want that psychological um, uh, state. They don't want shopping and buying to be the same thing. They want those to be two separate acts, or at least to have the control for them to be two separate acts. So if they go into a physical place, they might want to shop, but they might want to buy the product or acquire the product or take the product home in a very, very different way. You know, that's much easier within the user flow of their lives, right? Like have, have it shipped to their house. You know, maybe they just drive up curbside and that's how they get the product. Those are all the options that I think people want. And, and it's really that psychological differentiation between shopping and buying that I think is, you know, really where the future of retail lies. Yeah, definitely. You know, I think also it's a little bit like you kind of mentioned there too, really, you know, just based on lifestyle, like you mentioned, just having those two separate acts of really um, the whole shopping experience. So um, Steve, you're next here. Um, what do you see as the biggest catalyst in this type of change? So I said the biggest catalyst has really been, uh, I think, the combination of technology and, and really good old-fashioned entrepreneurial assistance. And the reason why I say that is, to Chris's point, um, you know, if you think about retail 20, 25 years ago, you know, Amazon was just starting out, but, you know, in order to, you know, shop on Amazon, you had, you know, you had to use your computer. You know, you had to, you know, there wasn't really the concept of, of, of mobile shopping, communication, th you know, things like social media, you know, information sharing. Just while the internet was there, communication still wasn't in this rapid fire way that it is today. You know, if you think about it, then, for, you know, the, so the online channel came there. Everyone realized, okay, we probably should have this website thing. But, you know, if you think about 20 years ago, some retailers, while they had websites, some didn't even have the site, it wasn't really linked to the store because it was just thought of as a separate channel. 
and then really what you had, I think, was in the mid 2000s to this point was where mobile came in. You know, now all of a sudden, you know, not only could I shop online, I don't have to be chained to my desk to do it. You know, I can do this from my phone. I, I can do this from, from wherever I want. Um, and, and then we went through a phase and we're still, you know, some retailers are still unfortunately in the phase where their brick and mortar store has become a little bit of an online, uh, a, a physical showroom for other online retailers. I think we could all think of retailers that that said, you know, and you know, the other thing I would say is the reliability of it. So for example, Amazon came out with Prime. You know, you pay at the time, I think it was 79 bucks a month when they first launched it and you get all your stuff in two days. Well, not only did, did they say it, they actually delivered on it. So it wasn't like the catalog where, you know, you place an order and okay, maybe in like four to six weeks, I'll get this thing. And when you get it, you're like, oh wow, I completely forgot I even ordered this thing. Um, you know, you can count on it. Now all of a sudden you're seeing that evolution and you're seeing how people between that and then things like social media communication, how information just moves so much faster. So, you know, technology has set this expectation that I don't want to wait. I want this now. And, and that I think is probably the biggest change that, that I've seen. Yeah, definitely. And Steve, I think that ties into the next question here um, for Chris really um, is that, you know, speed of delivery and fulfillment. So that customers are really looking for and that retailers are trying to achieve. So, um, you know, Chris, given everything we've said in your opinion um, and in your, you know, your experience and your interactions as well, what are the pillars of differentiation that retailers need to be successful? Yeah, sure. I mean, I think that's, I think it's kind of like we talked about in the presentation. I mean, I think the pillars of differentiation right now, I mean, it's still brand assortment and price, you know, but it's like we just said, it's, it, it's speed and convenience. And, you know, really that's a function of, um, I think that's just a function of changing society, right? You have, we talked about the mobile phone. The way I think about that is really the mobile phone is now our remote control for the physical world. Like we can really have anything we want at the press of a button, just like we are watching TV or that that's at least where we're going. And I think that's a really useful analogy to think about how kind of omni-channel or new retail is going to unfold. You know, and there's a lot of macroeconomic pressures um, making that a valuable tool. Like you start, you know, the, I talked about the generations, you know, you have the younger generation who thinks they can just be at high school and order Starbucks for delivery, you know, while they're sitting in class. And that's a really real thing. Um, and then you have the move towards, I, I would also add like urbanization where, you know, people are starting to move into cities because they like, you know, all the value that can create, but at the same time, there's trade-offs with that. And a lot of times those trade-offs, again, have to do with speed and convenience or finding new ways to operate within the kind of the standard user flows of your lifestyle day in and day out. And so, you know, I think that's, that's really what it all comes back to. So all four of those things are still very critically important. It's just the speed and convenience is completely new. And, you know, this new, you know, last few decades of retailing. Okay. And um, again, like, I think most of these will kind of tie into each other here, but um, you know, Chris, another one here for you, I think customer expectations, which we've addressed um, will always be top of mind for retailers. So, um, you know, how have these rising customer expectations really influenced the retail landscape? Yeah. I mean, I think on that front, I think you're just seeing a lot of people start to experiment with different ways about trying to, you know, or different ways in terms of how one can answer that question as a retailer. So you've got, you know, people experimenting with uh, making the checkout process more frictionless, you know, a la Amazon Go, you have companies like a Walmart or a Target thinking about how do you use your stores as a way to facilitate or make people's lives easier, whether as pickup points, whether as shipment facilities, um, curbside delivery, things of that nature. Um, and then you have, you know, companies looking at, okay, you know, how can I just, even for people that want to traditionally shop a store, Walmart's doing this with their lab store in New York, you know, even people that traditionally want to shop a store, how do I almost digitize my understanding of a store in the same way I can understand an e-commerce browser, where I can understand, you know, the funnel economics, I can understand what paths people are taking in the store, what journey, what products they're looking at, what they're converting on, what they're not. You know, and from there, analyze and use that data to then better serve up um, uh, more interesting consumer experiences, so to speak, or even maybe potentially optimize the efficiency, you know, of my, you know, workflow within that store itself. So, you know, I think you're just starting to see a ton of experimentation around all the edges of these questions and these points of differentiation that we've described. 
Okay, great. So, um, Steve, question for you here then. Um, you know, I think a lot of us could agree that there's definitely a lot more delivery and pickup options for customers. So, I would say that they're a little bit more educated on um, how retail works, um, you know, maybe than they were two years ago. So, what should a customer know and not know when interacting uh, with a retailer's technology, specifically the, the OMS? Sure. So, you know, the interesting thing about the order management system is, in a lot of ways, it's the most important piece of technology in the stack, and the customer has no idea that they're even, not only do they have no idea that they're interacting with it, they, a lot of cases have no idea it exists. So if you think with the average customer, assuming that they don't have a background in retailer technology, you know, obviously they know they interacted with, with a commerce platform, whether it be a mobile app or on, on the web, on their desktop website, because they, they interact with them. They, they know it happens. Um, furthermore, they understand that re, the, these retailers have warehouses, and they could just make a reasonable assumption that there's probably some bit of technology in that warehouse. Or if they go to a store, you know, they know that they see computers, they see point of sale systems, they know there's technology. But the average consumer doesn't even understand that there is this concept called order management. Yet it is so critical. And why is it critical? Because it's the order management system that's going to inform the consumer where this inventory is. So, for example, if they're shopping on their phone and say, okay, they could ship it to me for free in three days, or I can go pick this thing up at their store 10 miles away in, in, in an hour, the order management system is what's presenting that to the consumer on the commerce platform. The order management system is saying, okay, I can offer this consumer free shipping in two days. Because even though my warehouse is on the other side of the country, we have a store two hours away that can ship this next day, or next day via ground shipping. And I don't have to put this thing in the cart. It's the order management system really brings all of that together. And that's why it's so important to think of how the consumer will interact with your order management system, even if they're never going to look at an actual UI screen of your OR. Okay. So, I mean, Chris, what do you think as far as, um, you know, what features really define a successful omnichannel retailer? Yeah, I think jumping off what Steve said, I think it's really important to put, you know, like the order management system in context of what, like, successful omni-channel implementation looks like. And, you know, from my mind, it's, I coined the term a while back in my writing, um, I call it the kind of the holy trinity of, of omni-channel retailing. Um, and it's really three pieces, I think, you know, where the order management system sits is really in the first piece, and that's, it's really cloud computing. It, and, and Gene mentioned this to you, but to be successful in this new world, you have to have a real-time understanding of everything that's going on. And so the fundamental systems within that understanding are, of course, you know, the order management system in terms of where your inventory is sitting. Of course, there's also the point of sale system. So in terms of what's happening and how are you keeping a transaction log of that and what does that transaction log then trigger on the order management side. And of course, then your ERP systems built around how you're just operating in general. So, you know, cloud computing, you know, as kind of the nexus or one leg of the Trinity, so to speak, or one leg of the stool that makes that all happen. The second piece is what I call, for lack of a better term right now, the, the application layer. And so that's anything that's like a recording. It's basically a recording device. I talked about the mobile phone being a remote control. That can be a recording device. It could be a recording device via, say, a mobile browser, a mobile app. It could even be a recording device, say, as a scanning glow application inside of a shopping store, a la like Sam's Club Now down in Texas. You know, the customer is walking through a store and, rec and you're able to record as a retailer different activities that, you know, he or she is doing. Could even be things that sales associates have. Say it's a tablet a sales associate carries and how they use that to interact or record things as they help consumers or as they're doing their tasks on a, on a given day. Um, things like computer vision and, and monitoring inventory. But anything that's really telling you what's happening in a store um, or out of a store as well. Desktop browser would fall into that too. And then the third, third, the third uh, part of the Trinity uh, is really what I call contextual understanding. Um, and contextual understanding is really about both understanding both really the mind and the body of the consumer in terms of where he or she is. Um, the simplest way to think about it is I walk into a store and like I was describing before, you know everywhere that customer is going. You know what path they're taking, what they're looking at. 
what they're converting on, what they're not. And as a result of that, you can put a lot of analytics against it to then make better recommendations and create overall better experiences. The other, the other element to that, which I think is really important in this new world that you're just now starting to see, you're seeing it by way of Alexa, you're seeing it by way of an announcement last week that Amazon might be working on a wearable device to help understand consumers' emotions, is really what is that emotional state that people have? Social commerce is about this too. But it's really, you know, knowing, okay, you know, where are people in their day? Where are people in their mindset? What are the things they like to think about? What are the things they don't like to think about? And putting that in the context of shopping. And so when you can combine both the understanding of where people are in body, in space, with also where they are in their head, the blend of all of that becomes really powerful analytically. So it's really those three leg of the, legs of the stool, you know, that make, I think, all of this happen. And that's really where I think retailers are headed. That's where the most aggressive and futuristic looking retailers are headed down the road as well. Okay, great. So let's kind of back it up a little bit here. Um, Jean, this question's for you. Um, you know, so a retailer is really looking to move into the omni-channel world. Um, how would they best prepare to select an order management system? Well, I think it starts with the, the retailer defining what omni-channel means for them and their customers first, right? So I understand the end state, the target, where, where we're trying to go, right? And, and, a, and a realistic timeline for that, right? Um, start there. And then start thinking about how your organization is aligned around those objectives. So, you know, if we want to do certain things that require us to be more nimble with inventory or with the way we're going to fulfill, maybe we're going to fulfill from stores, uh, start thinking about the organizational impacts. Once you've worked your way through what you think the end state should be, at least the first set of goals, and what you think your organizational opportunities and challenges are, then start thinking about what technology will fit, right? Starting first with a, an internal look at who we are today. What technology do we have? You know, is my technology stack old enough that it now qualifies constitutionally to run for president, right? We need to start there and think about, do I have systems in my organization that would support a real-time operation? Once we have that understanding, so we've thought about you know, what the end state is, we've thought about our, our people, we've thought about our current technology and the processes that will go around the, the, the transition, then start thinking about te the actual order management technology, right? Uh, a lot of times, right, um, people go off and do this on their own and it can be a frustrating experience, right? So I would recommend finding a trusted advisor, whether it's somebody that you know that you've worked with in the past or somebody who's got industry expertise, but really find somebody who will help you take the work that you've just done and synthesize that into the right order management solution for you, right? So there's a variety. There are probably dozens of order management solutions out there. And um, they all have a slightly different flavor. Some of them at one end are really just rules-based engines that, that grew out of a client server world and have been sort of moved to the cloud. At the other end, there are opportunities to look at solutions that are AI and machine learning based, we're, we're born in the cloud, are integration first. So thinking through where you are and where you wanna get um, to ultimately is, is the place we start with this and then find a trusted advisor um, to distill that for you and then move forward with the technology selection and ultimately the journey is integration and implementation. So going off of that, um, Steve, why should, you know, an OMS implementation um, be thought of as, you know, a, a pretty detailed integration project? Yeah, so, you know, to Gene's point, you know, the goal of the OMS and the role of it in your stack should be to, to tie everything together, all of your orders, all, but more importantly, probably all of your inventory. Whether that inventory be in your own warehouse, in your stores, at a 3PL location, at drop to vendors, what have you. So in order to have all that information in your OMS, you have to be, you have to have communication with all of these different entities. Some of these entities may be under your control, you know, like your own warehouse or your own stores. Some of them may not be, like a 3PL or, a, a, say a dropship vendor, they may use different systems. But 
in order to really harness the power of what an LMS will bring you, you know, you need to have all that information, ideally in near near real time or real time. Well, in order to do that, we'll need to integrate with them. So, in terms of integration, it, it's so important that that the, the data integrity you thought of as you know data integrity first. So, if I go through the effort of integrating inventory, it does me no good unless that inventory is accurate, unless that inventory is updated in real time or at least near real time. Um, you know, when it comes to orders, we, the OMS needs to be the, that engine that orchestrates where orders go and what systems they're going to and, and keep track of the status of those orders. So it, it's really important that, that all of these different systems are communicating with the OMS rapidly so that the OMS can make proper decisions to best serve the consumer. Yeah, definitely makes sense, Steve. Um, thanks for that insight there. Um, so we're kind of wrapping up here on the fireside chat. Uh, Chris, this last question is for you. Um, what do you see are the uh, pros and cons of a market-based approach to Omnichannel? Yeah, well, uh, great question. I think uh, mm, I think for my from my perspective, I think it's the only way to go. I mean, a, a market-based approach to Omnichannel uh, just has a number of tremendous benefits. I think. You know, nor, I, nor, uh, CEO of Nordstrom said it on stage at Shop Talk. He said, you know, they, they've been introducing this thing called Nordstrom's Local, which is basically like a scaled down 3,000 foot guide shop of a Nordstrom experience. You don't actually buy any product there. It's all for try on and, and getting service and, and returning product. And he said, that's the future. And they're going to start to look at things that they're not going to look at the success of that in isolation. They're going to look at it. Uh, look at how it does based on how the total market does. So the way he's thinking about it in my mind is like, you know, every retailer has a toolbox, so to speak. And there's a number of different tools. It could be a guide shop, a pop-up store. It could be curbside delivery, shipping from store, physical stores itself, digital. It doesn't matter. All those are different tools in the toolbox. And then you evaluate yourself based on the success of the market in which you're operating and the consumers you're trying to reach. And that's really the only way to go because otherwise if you keep it bifurcated by channel, you get really perverse incentives. Um, you know, the financials don't always read the right way. And I've lived that and it's very hard to start thinking about in a different approach. So I think the companies that are t thinking about it that way as a market-based approach, how do you reach your customers? That's the way to go. The hard thing is just the cons of it is just, it's really hard to rewire your brains to think like that because people just haven't been doing it that way for so long. And I think like Gene mentioned, you know, when things started, digital could be a separate channel because it was a separate interaction point, but now it's not. And there's just, it's so much more multifaceted. It's hard to understand, you know, where to attribute different successes to different points of contact within the retail value chain. And so the market-based approach is really the only way to do that effectively, in my opinion. Yeah, definitely. And I think that kind of ties into our, uh, theme of the webinar series too of kind of unifying that physical and digital commerce so um, thank you all so much uh, I think we do have some time for maybe uh, one question from the audience so um, we'll open up the um, audience Q&A and so um, Jean, Stephen, Chris, uh, whoever kind of wants to speak up here we did have a question come through so um, really how long does it usually take to put in an OMS and you know, kind of get up and running. Well, this is this is Gene. I'll I'll take that. Um, you know, we've seen OMS implementations that literally can can be counted in weeks, right? But those are outliers. Um, the answer to your question really is, how well did you do the things that I just discussed a couple minutes ago, right? Did you prepare? Do you understand the organizational challenges and opportunities? And have you done a good job? partnering with somebody to understand the technology that's available. And it really depends on the complexity of your organization. But these are journeys that are really transformation at their, at their core. So they're measured um, in months, uh, definitely. Uh, you know, it's usually the effort is a six to 18 month effort. Um, and I've seen them go substantially longer um, due to either complexity or lack of preparation, but a retailer should think about this journey as being something that's going to Take them a while because it's a transformation and they should set reasonable expectations it, They they want to be cautious that they don't want to come back and do this work again in three years because they they rush through the process 
So doing the initial steps, really focusing on understanding who you are, who your customer wants you to be, and how that aligns with your organization will allow you to move more quickly through this, but still will take a little bit of time. Okay, great. Um, if anybody else on the call has um, more questions or any follow-ups, uh, we do have a contact info slide coming up that will provide information on how to get in touch with Gene, Steve, and Chris. Um, so, you know, with that, a couple closing remarks here. Anybody, Chris, um, Steve, or Gene, have any uh, anything to add? Well, Steve, I uh, would just once say again, one I, I thanks. Go ahead, Gene. Go ahead. Sorry. Okay, I was just gonna say, you know, the 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 challenge here is not should you get an order management um, system, but how will you embrace omnichannel, and when will you get a modern order management system to do to to execute that and provide success for your organization? And then Steve, yeah, did you absolutely. have to add to? Yeah, absolutely. I, I'd say it's not, I agree and wholeheartedly with what Gene said. I would also add to that is not only around order management system, but to the, some of the points brought here is how are you going to unify your approach to retail, whether that be e-commerce or book and more or dropship or, or what have you. How are you going to, you know, the order management system is a piece of technology, but how are you going to, to unify that approach um, to best serve your consumer? Okay. Yeah, All right, great. Great. I don't think I'd add much more. I think I'd just say, you know, put everything within the context of your business flywheel and who you are as a retailer and what you're trying to accomplish and then, you know, decide what are the best pieces and best next step for you. Okay, great. Well, um, you know, thank you to all of those who were able to attend today's webinar and um, thank you to Gene, Steve, and Chris for sharing these actionable insights um, about, you know, moving into the omni-channel world and as Gene kind of said, really embracing omni-channel. So like I said, if you have any follow-up questions, feel free to reach out to our panelists today, and um, everybody have a great day. Thank you.